everybody. So I'm really excited. We are here for our first um, kind of full episode of Chicks on Flicks. We did, uh, I guess this is really our second episode, but we did our first episode on uh, Roger Ebert's uh, documentary, Life Itself. And now it's our first uh, episode on a fiction film, I guess. And uh, we're here to talk about Apollo 13. And we're going to be talking about the 33 films that Roger Ebert said would give you, restore your faith in humanity. And the first one is Apollo 13. And Christine is here with me. And, Hi, uh, everybody. Yeah. And I'm really excited uh, for, this pro- you know, for this project, for this podcast. And uh, one of the things that I wanted to, I guess, sort of clarify at the front is, you know, some podcasts that we have done, we have really gone deep into, and we have, uh, I mean, I think we talked about Lawrence of Arabia for two hours, <laughs> and <laughs> which is awesome, and I love that, don't get me wrong, but I, I, we're going to try for this podcast to keep it a little bit more succinct and just give you a little bit of a flavor of the film, uh, so it's not going to be the in-depth, every plot point, every character kind of analysis that we've done maybe in the past, because we want to try to keep these around 30 to 45 minutes is the goal. It'll be 45. (laughs) (laughs) But that's going to be the goal. (laughs) So, uh, all right. So today we're talking about Apollo 13 and, uh, and uh, Roger, he, uh, he, his big, I think, uh, moment that our big reason why he calls this a film that would restore your faith in humanity is just what people were able to do with so little uh, that you think of where technology was at the time and what they were able to do with that technology to get to the moon and and then what they were able to do to get these people back uh, and and how just sort of inspiring that is and it's almost more like i feel like he thinks that the space program itself restores faith in humanity more than the than this particular uh story uh, it's almost it's something bigger i think to him uh that uh, he says and he says the space program was a really extraordinary thing something to be proud of and those who went into space were not just heroes which is a cliche but brave and resourceful so that's kind of uh the rogers uh sort of view of the of the film Hmm. And uh, and I don't know. What did you think of it on the rewatch uh, the, of uh, Apollo 13? It was even better than I remembered it. <laughs> I really liked this movie when I was a kid. I loved space. Um, and like my one of my favorite movies of all time is Contact. And even though that is science fiction, I feel like it is very scientifically minded. It was the kind of thing I loved growing up. Do you know what year this movie came out? 1995. 1995, right. So I think I saw it when it came out. I think it was one of the first, like, grown-up, uh, I think it's PG-13 movies, right, um, that I had ever seen. And so watching it, I, I, and I watched it multiple times then, but it's been a long time since I've seen it. And watching it again, I was just like, this, this is even better. And everything that went over my head, too, there were some sexual jokes and things um, that I didn't catch it at all when I was a kid. Now I caught them and I could also just follow the dialogue a lot better. As a kid, it was just nice that everything's dramatic and you can mostly tell what's happening, but watching it as an adult, it, you can follow the technical uh, aspect more. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, I, I, you know, I saw it when I was, I was 14 when it came out. And so it was right around uh, the, the, uh, I think I was eighth or ninth, freshman in high school, something like that. And uh, so I loved it, of course. <laughs> and I think it does hold up really well. I, I think the the special effects hold up, the acting holds up. Uh, they And it's not, I really like the right stuff. Uh, the But the right stuff is, uh, which is also about the Mercury missions and the, the uh, pilot, um, test pilot, uh, section of of uh this space program uh but the 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 right stuff is really long (laughs) Mm -hmm. uh it's good but it's 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 really long (laughs) it's almost three hours long and uh, this is i think i like this better personally if i was gonna have to pick because uh this is just so much more succinct and so much more the pacing is just so much better 
than that one, in my opinion. Uh, and it's also just about that one covers so many characters. And anyway, it's another discussion. But but this is just so much more succinct, and it's just got such a, such great performances across the board yeah. uh, by all involved. Uh, and it's one of those ones movies I really appreciate where uh, that that's really rich in the sense that you see character arcs from a lot of characters. <laughs> yeah, it's it's one thing to write a story or a movie or whatever and have your lead character have a full story arc where they learn and grow and whatever. Uh, and sometimes that's all you need for a story. It just depends on the story, but it is a really great experience when you have, I mean, here there's probably 12 characters that have like a real like story arc and learn something and become better people. And you know, the whole, whole nine yards. Yeah. I should mention too. Um, I did a little bit of an experiment because my son who's six loves space. And I was like, I liked this as a kid. I wonder how interested he'd be in it. And so I told him about it. I said, you know, it's a movie about something real that happened, even though it's actors, the story is true. And he was fascinated and he sat through the whole movie. Yeah. Like he, he just watched the whole movie with me. And there were a lot of questions, you know, cause I had to read all the subtitles. Well, most of them, he's starting to learn how to read. So he was getting some of them, but I, I was amazed at how well the movie's written so that even a six year old, you know, is interested. Like he has not yet sat all the way through star Wars. Mm -hmm. Like, I've been trying to do that. <laughs> but, um, and the two-year-old, the thing is, is the only content in this movie really is language. Um, right. And the two-year-old, she actually sat, I would say probably a good 40 minutes into the film before she started crawling around, but she never left the room. And when they make it through the atmosphere and you know the heat shield doesn't burn off, they were both clapping and cheering. Like they knew what was happening. So... I mean, that's a story well told, frankly, when you've got a 30-year-old, a six-year-old, and a two-year-old who are all clapping at the right time, you know? <laughs> that's true. There's a timeless quality to it that, that you don't, that anybody can enjoy this movie. I, I, I really I would have a hard time believing anybody wouldn't like it. Like, I, I'm sure there are, there's people who dislike every movie, <laughs> but, but I don't know. I would be surprised because <laughs> it just seems like, it does have something for every age group, every taste, yeah. every, it's not something that you have to be super into the space program or super into, and it's just a really uh, life affirming, really encouraging, really uh, interesting movie. You can, th you can like it on a, if you're thinking about media, if you're thinking about, uh, if you're thinking about the space program, if you're thinking, you know, now we don't have one, you know, so you can think about from that level, you can think about, uh, it, it, there's just so many ways that you can uh, analyze it and think about it and everything else. I, I, I liked uh, that Roger, he said, inspired by the, uh, the space program as a child. And he never, uh, and he always, I guess, assumed that, that everybody would be inspired by the space program. And here, Ari he says, well, when I was a kid, they used to, predict by the year 2000 you'd be able to go to the moon nobody ever thought to predict that you'd be able to but nobody would bother that was mm. pretty pretty interesting so you can think about it from that level and what has happened and everything and uh problem solving there's just so many things but let's let's kind of dive into it a little bit uh the one thing i wondered about is we live in this era i call it spoiler phobia where everybody is so scared hmm. about getting spoiled about a movie. And there are definitely, definitely epic moments that if you do get spoiled, it sucks. You know, we've come to this spot where literally almost any detail to certain people, it's like, you ruin the movie. And I, I hate it. It drives me crazy. And, and, and it, it, it annoys me because as a critic or as a, you know, amateur critic, I can't talk about anything. You know, so it's like every review ends up being super boring and bland mm -hmm. because you can't give any kind of analysis because people freak out about spoilers. And so uh, anyway, what, where I'm going with that is that one of the interesting things I think about this movie is that almost everybody knows what's going to happen. And yet it's still, 
it's still very engaging, even if after I've seen it multiple times. And mm -hmm. I mean, so I'm curious to you, how do you think they're able to make that work? That they're able to tell a story, much like say a Titanic or, or something like that, that we know the we know the ending, we know basically what's gonna be happening all along the way, but it still is engaging. I think that the way they manage it is through really artful foreshadowing because when you know what's going to happen and it's been well foreshadowed, then on a second viewing, you're enjoying it even more than the mm, first time. You know, like the opening scene when, um, and I had to write down their names because I don't want to get them mixed up. Uh, Jack Swigert, when Jack Swigert is at the party and he's hitting on the woman with the beer bottle and the cup that he's talking about, you know, getting the module into the right configuration and everything. And, you know, upon the, on the first viewing, it's a sexual innuendo with this astronaut. But later in the movie, it's like, oh, okay, no, this applies. And that's one of the simplest and, um, you know, most basic of their foreshadowings, but they have it just all throughout the movie sparkled through, you know, um, sprinkled through where it's like, it's, it's, they're all Easter eggs. They're all treats now. And, and you feel even more smart and it keeps you invested because yes, you know, what's coming, but you know, what's coming, you know, <laughs> yeah. that's a really good point. I hadn't thought of that. You know, the way that, uh, that Tom Hanks in, on earth is, is able to cover up the moon. And then the way that later on he's able to mm -hmm. cover up earth and, so you, there are a lot of little sort of foreshadowing going on. And uh, I think that's true. And I, the reason why I think it works is because they create such compelling characters mm -hmm. that you want to see how these characters get through what you know is going to happen. Mm -hmm. And, and that's what makes it compelling. And I do think the script is pretty tight, but uh, you, all of them, I think are really good characters. I, you know, obviously, uh, Tom Hanks is, uh, is great actor, uh, but, uh, you know, Jim Lovell is an interesting character. You know, he's this, this character who's always wanted to go to the moon and somebody who's a dreamer, but also I think he's pretty realistic, like pretty, he's also a realist, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, I don't know, he's just a really relatable guy. And then you have, uh, so many different, like I said, so many different characters, but you've got, uh, Ken Mattingly, Jack Swigert, uh, you have uh, Fred Hayes, all these characters. Uh, you know, you get this story of Ken Mattingly getting exposed to the measles. He can't yeah. go. Uh, you have also, I really like, uh, I guess, Ed Harris is Gene Kranz, uh, and the head of the um, uh, Mission Control. He's great. Uh, I like a lot of the other little individual members of the Mission Control Center. And uh, so you sort of see stories of them. His wife, I think, is pretty good. You've got all these characters that I think are, are well done, well acted, and you want to see how they get through all these experiences. And that's why I think it works. I agree, absolutely. Yeah. So it's just really interesting. So my, I guess my next question is, is about the acting. Were there, uh, what did you think of the acting in general and were there moments uh, that really stood out to you uh, that you thought were particularly strong or, uh, yeah. Um, I mean, the acting is just good all across the board. Yeah. And my, it was so funny too, cause my son was like trying to wrap his mind around the fact that it was a true story, that they were actors playing real people, but it wasn't the real people. <laughs> um, I think it was very, very convincing for him. I think it, for him, it was like watching a documentary. It was just footage, you know? Um, and so as far as like moments that, you know, really stand out, um, uh, Gene Kranz crying <laughs> when they get through the atmosphere at the end, <laughs> I think is really beautiful. I don't yeah. know if that actually happened or not. I was reading something online that said, that in real life, no one got to stand up and cheer because Gene Kranz never would have allowed it at Mission <laughs> Control. Um, but to have that moment of emotion, whereas the rest of the whole movie, he's, you know, keeping it real, um, is really good. I think yeah. that, honestly, I really, I like Bill Paxton and Kevin Bacon. I think that they... Um, yeah, I agree. I, I, they're so compelling. 
Yeah, I think that that uh, Bill uh, Paxton has some great work when he's particularly when he's just so cold, and he yes. just feel him giving up. And I like the fact that they don't make uh, Jim Lovell, the Tom Hanks character, cheesy. Like he, right? He he's frustrated too. He's scared too. Uh, but he is the leader, and so he he encourages and he. Uh, you know, does what he has to do, but, uh, but I don't know. He just, I felt like he, he could have been so much more maudlin with a poor script, mm-hmm. but he wasn't. Mm-hmm. It felt genuine, their relationship. And I think Gary Sinise is fantastic in this. Oh, yes. Uh, as Mattingly, you know, you, you get this uh, disappointment at him not being able to go on the, the, the flight, but then his dedication in staying, you know, and doing the simulations and doing the simulations. And, and uh, you have so many different sort of uh, things going that it really feels like this sense of victory for all. Uh, and I, I, I think that maybe a lesser actor uh, the, uh, than Tom Hanks would have made it sort of his victory and his, you know, that he did, but this is really an ensemble victory. It's an ensemble uh, feeling when it all happens because everybody had to to be involved, and and so I, I think that there's just so many good little little moments. Yeah, well, and with Gary Sinise's um, portrayal, I thought one of the things that was so good about it is if you think back to the movie, it's like you almost remember him having more lines than he actually had. Yeah. Um, because he really doesn't say a whole lot. Like during the launch, he just shows up in his car, you know, in the distance uh, from the launch. And I don't think he even says anything. He's just on screen. And yet he's able to convey so many different emotions from this character. And you understand exactly what this character is thinking and feeling. I just thought that was amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And I don't know, he, 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 again, is another character that could come across really cheesy, but he he doesn't, and he comes across as really relatable and really good. And I, a couple of my favorite moments uh, were with I really think the the expression on Tom Hanks' face, on Jim's face, when he says we've lost the moon, and that, and you just see they're so close to it, they can see it, you know, that's right there, and and this expression on his face, I thought was really really good mm. and uh, and then uh, I really like I, I think it's uh, Gene Kranz who says who says let's let's work the problem he says he says let's not make things worse by guessing mm. I, I think there's a lot of really good dialogue there with him and he, he feels like that kind of boss that's <laughs> just like <laughs> come on people <laughs> let's do this but it but it works and and then I also uh, liked uh, my favorite, probably my favorite moment of the whole movie is when is the whole sequence with the CO2 filter. Mm. And <laughs> I just love, I know something about, it. I've always loved that scene, you know, where it's like they, they've got to, the CO2 levels are getting through the roof uh, mm. in this, uh, uh, in, in this uh, unit that they're in, whatever. And uh, because they are having to turn off, they're trying to save as much of the battery as they possibly can so that they can make reentry. And they've been in the uh, the moon la- uh, lander thing. Uh, mm-hmm. And anyway, but the, the CO2 is, uh, without the battery, CO2 is becoming a problem. So anyway, they have to create this filter. And basically, they're like, how do we make this circle fit into this square? <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> and they just and they they just dump onto the table all the stuff that the pe- that they have in that uh, in that in that little capsule, and they have to figure it out. And I don't know. I just I've always loved that scene. I think it is so. Uh, it's just so charming. I guess. And so, I agree. Like, oh, what are they going to do? How are they going to figure this out? And uh, and I guess in one of the documentaries about this, they actually have the thing the device the yeah book. well and it's such an iconic moment it, i feel like it encapsulates the entire movie how do you make a square yeah. peg fit a round hole yeah and 
the funniest thing is, is they're not even the ones who came up with that like analogy, you know, like that, that's a thing, like fitting a square peg in a round hole, like it can't be done. And then here they are living it in real life. It's just amazing. <laughs> yeah. And I was reading about it after watching the movie to see like what was real and what wasn't. Uh -huh. And apparently for that, they did have that issue. And it, like you said, like they had to create something, but they had actually already done it during simulations. Oh, okay. And they really just did it out of like curiosity. They were like, wait, what if we had to do this thing? What would we do? And it was a vacuum cleaner. There was a vacuum cleaner in the command module that they then taped up and, and stuck on it. And uh, so they said when they had the problem in real life, they were like, hey, hey, do you remember that thing we did with the vacuum cleaner and then we all got a beer? Yeah, let's do that. And it, <laughs> it worked like a charm. Interesting. That's really interesting. Uh, yeah. What did you think of this? I guess the special effects in, in general. It was famous for having filmed uh, a lot of the shots in actual zero gravity that they got uh, a descending plane uh, mm -hmm. that they were able to uh, create actual zero gravity. So it's not like people hanging on wires. I'm sure some of it is, but, but they're actually to create some of that zero gravity. Uh, and uh, now just the other special effects. How did you feel about that? Um, I mean, I barely noticed the special effects in this. I just, they didn't grab my attention at all. Um, I did notice though, and thought about how good the zero gravity effects were. Um, and I imagined them being in one of these planes. But the thing is, is like, I'd watch it and try to imagine because the plane is not the same thing as a ship, right? Like, it's literally, they're, they're dropping. Like, that's why they're experiencing zero gravity, right? Like, and yet they're able to make the ship seem so still. Yeah, you're right. And they, they really are. I was like, how did they, it looks so good. And then the other thing I was thinking was, how much time did these actors get to spend in this simulated zero gravity module on this plane that's recreating this atmosphere? Like, because they look so comfortable. They look like they're real astronauts and they know what they're doing and where they're going and they're used to moving this way. And I was like, how much time did these actors have to put this together? That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, if I was in zero gravity uh, yeah, on a plane, I would think I would be like super motion sick and super, like I would have a hard time like giving any kind of performance of any kind. Yeah. And I mean, I know a lot of it probably was through wires and special effects and stuff, but because uh, obviously they're not doing a lot of the the scenes uh, in in this plane, but but uh, but I don't know the fact that you do, you don't notice the special effects says how good they are. It's just seen. Yeah. It looks and you can't tell the difference. No. Between when they're in the zero gravity plane and when it might be wires, you you can't tell. You couldn't no, tell. Not at all. You can't tell at all. And it looks like it's really earth out there. It looks like it's really the moon out there. There's nothing in my opinion that looks hokey. I think all the production design looks so good. It's so immersive. You really do feel like they're on this little, uh, this little capsule, this little, uh, plane and, uh, this, uh, and it is completely believable. I think hundred percent. Yeah. I, I did read online that one of the most unbelievable things about the movie and the thing they got the most wrong was okay. the moon through the window. Like apparently everyone at NASA, everyone, I don't know who this is, you know, general consensus, they love the movie, but mm -hmm. it shows the moon going through multiple phases, which it didn't. And then like, uh, apparently it's like in the wrong place in the window. I don't know. And so for people who know what to look for, I guess that really bothers them. And for everybody else, it's, it's a surprising point. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure that that is true. I was kind of like, I was talking, uh, and I, our Wonder Woman podcast with my friend, uh, Trevor, who's a, from how to love comics. He's obviously a comic expert. And he, he was saying sort of the same thing that like, he has to kind of turn off his comic expert side of him when he watches a comic book movie because it's very easy for him to nitpick he's like oh they did that or they changed that or they did that and, and uh, so he has to be like click <laughs> just appreciate it as his own thing uh, but uh, from from a layman's perspective they they certainly made it feel believable and uh, and immersive and and everything like that there's never anything that I feel like oh that was 1995 or, right <laughs> 
you know, like like you do with some films. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. And it was also kind of interesting to me to see that the support of NASA was starting to fade here with Apollo 13. And, you know, now we're in this, uh, we're in this phase where it's practically gone. The support, I mean, NASA, NASA basically is gone. There's no more shuttle launches and uh, it's, it's, it's only in a supportive kind of more role as opposed to what they had then. And uh, I don't know, it's, it's sort of interesting to think about uh, some of the themes when you look at the media and the way that all of a sudden they're interested in the story. And I think one of the, uh, one of the reporters or, or somebody says, well, now they have a story. Right. Uh, when she said, why didn't you report his video? Why didn't you report his cover the launch? He mm -hmm. says, well, now they have a story. Mm -hmm. And so all those things I think are kind of very relevant and very interesting. I also think the score is so good from James Horner. I love his scores. I think that he does such a good job of making gentle moments in his music he did uh rest in peace that whereas like someone like a john williams he's amazing of course uh but he has these big vibrato themes that's what john williams is known for themes and what i like about james horner is maybe he doesn't have like the most iconic theme like i'm not going out of a politician being like you know whistling some mm -hmm. theme uh but he creates these these softer more sort of a gentle moments, whether it's Lamb for Time or or this or or Titanic or whatever it might be, he is so I just think so good at that. He does that so well here. It just like he draws you into the story. It draws you into what Jim and the other uh, astronauts are feeling, experiencing uh, with these just sort of softer uh, music that accompanies it. I don't know. Did you have any thoughts about the music? You know what? I didn't even notice it, but I think yeah. I hit all the right emotional cues, which tells me that subliminally it worked. Right. <laughs> you know, like I'm laughing at all the right times, I'm crying at all the right times, and I'm cheering at all the right times. So the music must have worked. Yeah. I think this, do you think this was a good choice for Roger for his list of the 33 films that uh, restore faith in humanity? Is this a, a life affirming movie in your view? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And I think. It's really nice to have it as the first one on the list because yeah. it is really just fun and exciting. And, you know, one thing that I have kind of reflected on since watching it is there's no villain. And even in movies like The Martian, where you'd think it would be a similar situation, it's this life and death survival, man versus nature in space, but it's not. They put in like the guy trying to make money and, you know, like there are all these villains and this movie has no villains. It's a good point. I hadn't thought of that. You're right. Right. So it's like, it, I think it does restore faith in humanity because everybody's working for the same thing. They just want these people to survive and that's the top priority. Mm -hmm. And there's no disenchantment with, you know, people being sellouts and villains. So I thought that was an interesting thing. Yeah, and, it, and there is something I think inspiring about the space program and just like aspiring to be better, inspiring to, 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 to get to the moon. You know, there's something ins inspiring about that. It does sort of, it's a very uncynical film, which I really appreciate. I get so tired of, of cynicism and uh, modern <laughs> cynicism. So mm -hmm. I, I think it, I, it would, uh, it's a very worthy addition to the list. So I'm, gr I'm glad he added it and it was a, a fun one to start on. So. Uh, the the next one on our list is called The Band's Visit. I am completely unfamiliar with this film, so it's going to be uh, a fun experience for both of us in this case uh, to watch. And uh, and so we'll 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 see and I'll talk about it. I guess next week uh, or in our next podcast, and uh, that should be fun. All right, awesome. Yeah. So uh, where can people find you? So on YouTube, I'm youtube.com slash C Tyler vision. That's the letter C T Y L E R. Um, and on Instagram, I'm actually hosting a bookstagram challenge right now. Bookstagram is this quarter of Instagram where people just take pictures of books <laughs> and share books. Um, and this challenge I'm doing is hashtag Tykins challenge. That's T Y K I N S um, challenge. And 
we're doing prizes uh, in this month is science fiction. And so if you go to my Instagram account, you can see the details for that. My Instagram account is C Tyler Insta against the letter C. Um, and it's going to be really cool. We've got two signed science fiction books, um, one by Beth Revis, who did a Star Wars um, book based off of like Rogue One. And the other one is Kayla Olson, who um, just recently sold her book, The Sandcastle Empire, which was also bought by Leonardo DiCaprio's production company. Um, so, and they're going to include like a little personalized note and everything for the winners. So it's going to be cool. Okay, great. Well, that'll be really fun. I'll have a link uh, to that in the description section and uh, that'll be, that'll be fun. Uh, so we have, as far as the, the channel, uh, the podcast this weekend, my friend AJ and I are going to be talking all about Cars 3. So that will be a lot of fun. And then I am sometime next week going to be talking with my friend Tony about the year so far in films, but I'll get, I'll let you guys know when that is going to happen. Uh, we'll also have Dr. Who recap uh, me and Jonathan next week. So lots to look forward to. And uh, so thanks so much. I really appreciate you joining me to talk about Paul 13. It's my pleasure. <laughs>